Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for leading our singing tonight and our worship, and thank you to each of you uh, who are here tonight. Um, my good friend Kevin Langford told me before church, I just want to let you know that we were out by 6.40 last Sunday night. So um, I don't know how quite to respond to that except to say it ain't happening. So uh, just uh, yeah, hope you can sit back and uh, enjoy our time of study together. Just a couple of things before we begin our study tonight. If you have your Bibles, I do invite you to turn to Luke chapter 16, and we'll be um, studying this uh, account that Jesus told about in Luke chapter 16. I wanted to mention, uh, mention it briefly in our class this morning. Uh, Brother Lloyd Brookmole is turning 101 years old on Thursday of this week, and we all love Brother Lloyd. He is such an inspiration to all of us, and I know you'll want to express uh, your love for him as well sometime during this week. Uh, last year on his 100th birthday, he preached here on Wednesday night. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful blessing and a treasure he is to this church. I also wanted to mention that we did uh, uh, mention that and I had a prayer this morning for uh, Corona Drummond and her family. Corona's uh, mother passed from this life this week and the funeral will be Saturday, this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock at the Sherman Drive a church in Denton, and there'll be a viewing at Mulkey Bowles uh, Funeral Home in Denton on Friday from 6 to 8. And um, Corona, we just want you to know we love you, and we're so sorry about the loss of your mother and for all of your family. Uh, we know that that is um, an extremely difficult time anytime you lose somebody close to you. And I'd like to ask you if you would, let's uh, bow our heads and pray in Corona's behalf for just a moment. Father, we thank you for loving us and we thank you for showing your love to us in so many ways. Father, tonight, as uh, your people, we come before your throne uh, in behalf of one of our sisters, a Corona, and all of her family. Father, we know that they are grieving because they've lost uh, her mother, and these, uh, this family is grieving because they've lost someone who has been an inspiration to them throughout their lives. And Father, we pray that you will bless all of them in a special way tonight and throughout this week. We pray that you will bring them comfort. We pray that they might know of our love for them and our concern for them, and that we might show them that love and concern in every way that we possibly can. Father, give them peace, and we pray that you will protect them and watch over them through this week as they make plans for the funeral later on this week. And we pray that the memories that they have of their mother and grandmother and friend and family member will be um, dear in their hearts, and they'll be able to hold on to those memories uh, throughout life. Father, please bless everyone who needs our prayers tonight, all of those who are hurting, those around us that we love, and help us to show our love for each other every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So one of the problems with studying books of the Bible and, and going through the entire book is uh, sometimes you come on passages of Scripture that you think, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to skip this part. And this is one of those passages tonight, but we can't skip it. We can't skip it because, uh, because as a church, as people who are Christians, uh, we need to study this. We need to know this. We need to understand uh, what is going on in this particular section of Scripture. Uh, in maybe the most recent survey dealing with uh, eternity uh, among people in our country, um, Pew Research did a study in 2014, and in this study they said that um, 58 or 72 percent of all Americans believe that there is a place called heaven, and that heaven is a place where people go who live a good life and, uh, uh, and are good people. In this same survey, they found that only 59% of people in America believe in hell. And they believe that hell is a, a place that is um, a place of torments, and it is a place where people who do not live a good life go. And as you break down this particular survey, you'll see that um, about 85% of people who claim to be Christians believe in heaven, and about 70% of people who claim to be Christians believe uh, in hell. Um, it's interesting, as I was looking at this survey earlier today, 
that people who are a part of what this particular survey calls um, non-Christian uh, religions or non-Christian faiths, um, only 31% of people who claim that they are part of non-Christian faiths believe in hell. And so the fact is, uh, when you think about it, a majority of people in our country really don't believe that there is a place called hell. But the Bible speaks about this place called hell. And the question is, um, do we believe that it is real? Do we believe that potentially um, people will go there and that people will spend an eternity there? Now, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells, um, gives, gives to us um, some information about uh, what p- takes place after people die. Now, there's some, there's some thoughts about Luke 16 that, that uh, if you talk to different preachers and different religious leaders and maybe different scholars even, you'll get different ideas about this. Some people will tell you that Luke 16, starting in verse 19 through verse 31, is a parable. Uh, it could be a parable. I, I wouldn't make a, a big deal about arguing whether it's a parable or not. A lot of people say it's not a parable, and some say it's not a parable because If it is a parable, it's the only parable that Jesus ever told where he mentioned somebody specifically by name. And so in this parable, you're going to read about a man by the name of Lazarus, and you're going to read the name of Abraham in this parable. And so um, if if you believe it's a parable, that's okay, but it's the only, it would be the only parable that Jesus ever told where he mentioned specifically uh, people by name. Another thing that some people who don't believe it's a parable say, it's the only, if it was a parable, It's the only parable where Jesus ever mentioned a specific time frame. And so he talks in this this, uh, account that he's giving to us, he talks about uh, Moses and the prophets. And so some people wondered, is this man, was he living during the time of Moses and the prophets? Because uh, people could go, you could send somebody back, he said, and tell my loved ones they don't want to come to this terrible place of torments and... um, uh, He said, Abraham says to him, uh, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And so it appears that this is a a kind of a specific time frame. Now, whether you believe it's a parable or whether you believe it's a real account, I don't think that's real significant. The next big question about this particular um, place in Scripture, and, and let me just mention, it seems like that beginning in verse 19 through verse 31, that the writers and the authors of Scripture have inserted, has inserted this particular section of Luke 16, a very odd place to me. Uh, When you're reading along, uh, Jesus has been talking, he told about the unjust uh, or unrighteous steward in the beginning of chapter 16, and then uh, he comes down to verse 18, he's talking about if anybody divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. And then he goes in to this um, story or whatever you want to call it about a rich man who is who, uh, habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And he talks about uh, Lazarus, a man who, who was covered with sores and he was a very poor man. And he begged for the crumbs of the table at the rich man every day. And so it seems to be in an odd location, this particular account. Um, I, don't know, I don't know why it's here, but, this is, uh, but what we do know is that Jesus is the one who, who is doing the talking here. And so Dr. Luke, remember, is kind of writing as if he is investigating the life of Jesus. And in his kind of investigation of Jesus, he has interviewed certain people apparently. We've heard a lot of, uh, from different people. But now he wants to, to let Jesus tell us uh, about, this, uh, about what happens after somebody dies. And there's the thought about, is this about a temporary waiting place or is this about an eternal waiting place? And that's a whole different kind of topic. Um, the word that Jesus uses here for the word um, hell that is found in the Old King James Bible um, <laughs> It is recorded in other translations. The translation uh, that Ron read for us used the word Hades. Uh, that particular Greek word is a word that, um, that is pronounced in the Greek Hades. Uh, it is translated, it is transliterated from the Greek to the English 
um, using the word Hades in most of our English translations, but some translations translate this word hell. Now, the problem with translating it hell is there's another Greek word that is more often translated hell, and that is the word Gehenna. And you've heard that word Gehenna, and it is translated a hell uh, as well. And so the question is, is this, is this about a temporary waiting place? We can have a discussion about that. Is this uh, about eternity? But what we do know is, that's about two people who passed from this earth, and one person was um, seemingly in this life a very blessed, a very rich man, and he ended up in the place called of torments. He ended up in torments. The other uh, man uh, was a, a poor man in, on this earth, but he ended up in a place called paradise. Now, most people believe that Hades is a larger realm of these two places called torments and paradise. And so it's the, uh, the word Hades literally means the place of the unseen. And so here are these two individuals uh, after they pass away, one in torments and one in paradise. The bottom line is that if, if people live right and they live according to the will of God and they've become children of God and they've been obedient to the will of God and they've lived lives of faithfulness to God, they will end up in paradise or in heaven. If people do not live right and they refuse to obey Jesus and they be, do not become Christians and they do not remain faithful and loyal to Christ throughout their life, they will end up in torments. And so I wanted to kind of take that and talk a little bit tonight about this idea of hell. Because in America, we don't talk about hell very much. We don't like to talk about hell. That seems, it seems uncomfortable. It seems uh, like a topic that uh, it isn't mentioned very much, even in churches in our day, even in what we might call more conservative churches. We prefer to hear about the love of God and about the, po the possibilities of abundant life uh, that God wants to give us. Uh, hell was called by one writer, the forgotten doctrine of the Christian church. And um, even as I think about this and I talk about this, I find that preaching on hell is difficult. And maybe the reason that it's difficult is because the truth be told is that we all know people that we fear might be in hell. Or we know people that if they don't change their life, if they don't turn to Christ, if they don't turn their life over to Him and become obedient to God, they might be in hell. And so hell is hard to talk about because, because we uh, have fear that there may be some people that we know and love who might be on their way to that horrible place. My goal tonight is not to necessarily convince you to change your mind, but my goal is to try to talk about uh, this topic in a way that would be pleasing to God. So I want to do so under three questions tonight. Number one, is hell a real place? Is it a real place? Now, there are only two ways to answer a question like this. Either we, we can um, listen to what human beings say or we can hear what the Word of God says. And the most obvious biblical fact is that Jesus believed in hell. You don't have to take my word for it. If you read the four accounts of the gospel, you'll discover that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. You'll discover that, in fact, the, all the apostles believed in hell. You'll discover that the church has always believed in hell. This is one of those rare points that, that many different religious groups will will uh, zero in on and agree on. And so for 2,000 years, um, the church or religious people have united in saying that those who have rejected Christ will spend eternity in hell. Because Jesus is the Son of God, He spoke with divine authority. And this story in Luke chapter 16 offers maybe the clearest picture of what an eternal hell will look like. Because these words become, uh, come from Jesus. We have to treat them with respect because as the Son of God, He demands, um, He speaks with divine authority. And what He says can be trusted. And I realize that, that some people, again, prefer this to be a parable. But even if you believe this is a parable, even the parables that Jesus told had substantive meaning to them. And so a beggar named Lazarus sat at the gate of a rich man hoping for scraps from his table. He was so poor that the dogs licked his sores. 
And when he died, the angels carried him into a place called Abraham's bosom. Many people believe that's a Jewish expression for paradise or, or heaven. The rich man died and he went to this place called Hades. And even though his body was buried, the rich man's soul still existed and somehow it maintained some kind of sensory perception of what was going on not only in his own life but at least what he perceived was going on in the lives of people that he loved back on the earth. In Luke 16, verse 24, he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame or in this fire. It's a kind of, of prayer. Uh, one writer said, from heaven or from hell to heaven, from the damned to the redeemed. And Abraham replies, it can't happen because there's a, a great gulf or a great a chasm fixed between us and so that nobody can come from here to you and nobody can come uh, from where you are to here. No one in heaven can cross over and no one in hell can cross over. And what we learn from this is that, that eternal destinies are fixed. Once we arrive at that eternal destiny, whether we are in heaven or whether we are in hell, whether you want to call that Abraham's bosom or paradise or, or torments or uh, Gehenna, once we are there, we are fixed and it cannot be moved. The rich man in hell thinks about his five brothers back on earth who are, um, who are not living like they should. They're not following the Lord. And he says, can we just send somebody back and tell them about this horrible place? The picture that Jesus paints is that if somebody is in hell, they would want to go back to the earth and tell people that they love not to come to this place. Ladies and gentlemen, that ought to be enough right there for us to say, I don't want to go to that place. If somebody there wants to come back and tell others who he loves, I don't want you to come here, then that ought to be enough to, for all of us to say, that's not where we want to be. I don't want to go to that place. So once we are in heaven, we will always be in heaven. And once people are in hell, they will always be in hell. So here's some things that we learn about uh, from this particular context about hell being real. And number one, people, even though they have passed physically from this earth, they are still alive. Both Lazarus and the rich man survived their own funerals. They're still living. Now, they're not living in a physical sense in the way that, that people are living on this earth. The book of Ecclesiastes says that, that when man dies, the, 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 the body returns to the dust of the ground and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We're composed of, of, a phys, of physical matter. We're composed of a body and we're composed of spirit. When Jesus um, died and he was raised from the dead, the Bible says that uh, he, he did not uh, want people, uh, that people wanted to come and touch him sometimes. But Jesus said, some people thought that he was a spirit, but Jesus said a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And so when people go to their eternal destination, it is the soul or the spirit that is going to that eternal destination. The body has returned to the dust of the ground. Number two, the dead retain apparently their personalities and their essential character. Lazarus is still Lazarus and the rich man is still known as the rich man. And even in their place of eternity, they could hear, they apparently could feel something, they could recognize, they could remember, they could speak, they could reflect on their life. Think about that. Wherever we go to spend eternity, we will be able to reflect on our life. They could plead, and they will definitely suffer, and they will think about others. There's only one thing this man could not do. He could not leave that horrible place. We can't leave once we're there. Number three, death marks the final separation between the saved and the lost. Whether you believe this is about a waiting place or whether you believe this is about an eternal destination, the result is still the same. 
This is the final separation between the saved and the lost. Once we are in heaven with God, we will be with him there forever. Once we are in hell separated from God, we will be there forever. No one can pass from heaven to hell or from hell to heaven. Number four, hell is a place of horrible suffering. Three times Jesus mentions in this this account the torment, the suffering, and the agony of this man. Hell is a place of horrible suffering. This man is going through great pain and great agony. Number five, those in hell will cry out for help that that cannot come. None of this rich man's pleas or his prayers were answered in the way that he wanted them answered, nor could they be. Somebody has said that hell will be a place where people will be screaming for relief, and they'll be screaming for help, but that relief and that help cannot come. Is hell for real? If you take the words of Jesus at face value, the answer has to be yes. Consider what this man knew. He knew that there was no way out for him. He knew that his brothers could avoid this horrible place if they repented. Listen to this. As long as there is life and breath within people on this earth, there is hope. Some of us who are here tonight have loved ones, people who are dear to us, who have walked away from God, who have walked away from the church, who have walked away from Jesus, and and we're, we're concerned about them. What we need to remember is that as long as they have breath and life, there is hope, and we should never give up. One of the things that this man learned was that that even his brothers back on earth, if they could just learn about this place, and if they could repent, then maybe they would escape this horrible place. He knew that someone needed to warn them about the danger they were in. I remember hearing a preacher say years ago that here is a picture of a man in hell who has more evangelistic fervor and spirit in his life than most Christians on earth have because he knew he didn't want people to go there. And I'm saying to all of us who are children of God, one of the great lessons that we need to learn from Luke chapter 16 is that there needs to be within us a a spirit and an enthusiasm and a zeal for teaching people the gospel of Jesus, not to frighten anyone, but because we don't want anybody to spend eternity in the place where this man was. So is hell for real? The answer is yes. Number two, is hell eternal? In recent years, there's been a growing debate on this topic in in many religious circles and some uh, well-respected scholars and even preachers, and I'm Um, unfortunately, and I'm sorry to tell you that even preachers in the church of Christ have argued in favor of what is called annihilationism. And that is the the view that at some point after death, the unsaved are kind of uh, incinerated by God and they simply cease to exist. exist. So they say hell is temporary. It only lasts for a moment. That people go to hell and then uh, their bodies are consumed their spirits are consumed and they, uh, they no longer exist in hell. It's argued that annihilation is far preferable to the kind of the traditional view that hell is a place of eternal perm- uh, torment. Some say that the doctrine of hell is like an immoral doctrine. It somehow makes God vindictive. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, here's what the Bible says about hell, that God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. That's why God created hell. He created hell for the devil and his angels. Look, God doesn't want anybody to spend eternity in hell. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. 2 Peter 3 says, the Lord is not slow concerning his promises, as men count slowness, but he's long-suffering to us, not willing that anyone should perish. Our loving Father wants every person to be saved. He doesn't want to send anyone to hell. He initially, I believe, prepared hell for the devil and his angels, 
And he determined that those who refused to follow him and those who turned their back on him would spend eternity there as well. Here are some of the biblical words and phrases associated with hell. The word smoke and the word fire. Burning and torment. Bottomless pit. Everlasting prison. Wrath. Weeping. Wailing. Gnashing of teeth. Unquenchable fire. Eternal fire. The second death. The furnace of fire. Damnation. Blackness and darkness. Those images and symbols, when you look at those, they don't sound like an annihilation. Consider the words of Matthew 25, verse 46. Then they, Jesus says, talking about the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Listen to the verse again. These are the words of Jesus talking about the end of time. Matthew 25, verse 46. Then they, the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now here's what's important about that statement. In the Greek language, the word for eternal is used in both of these clauses. And the word eternal means the same thing. It's the same word. It's the same word in the Greek and it's the same word in the English. If eternal life is unending, we have to believe that For that reason, that eternal punishment must be the same. Jesus said that some go into eternal punishment and some go to eternal life. He used the same words. In Mark chapter 9, verse 47 and 48, Jesus offers a a kind of a graphic description of hell. Listen to what he says. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye then have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I remember hearing that and reading that the first time and I thought, what does that mean? The worm does not die. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not, the concept of the worm comes from the burning trash dump called Gehenna in the Hinnom Valley outside of Jerusalem. The fire burned around the clock. The worms would crawl through the decaying mess and seemed that they would never die. The idea of the worm is used to speak of eternal torment, of of a guilt-ridden conscience, and of evil desires that can never be satisfied as long as the, the fire exists. And the fire speaks of eternal torment. Revelation 14, verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises, listen to these words, forever and forever. There's no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image, for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Revelation 20 verse 15 says, if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he is thrown into the lake of fire. As badly as we might like to think that people who find themselves in hell will be annihilated or it will only last for a minute overwhelming, the overwhelming knowledge of Scripture suggests that it will be an eternal punishment. That as long as heaven lasts, hell will last that long as well. And that brings me to the third question I want to mention just briefly, and that question is, is hell necessary? This is kind of the bottom line. Of what use is it to even talk about hell? Why would we speak of the doctrine of hell? And, you know, some of us would want to shy away from it because we think that it it kind of detracts from the message of the gospel. And it's kind of unfortunate because hell serves, the doctrine of hell serves purposes. It provides the knowledge about a final justice. God 
uses hell as it were in order to right the wrongs of life. What about child, what about people who abuse little children? What about people who who rape and murder babies? What about people who corrupt the hearts and the lives of our young people? What about people who abuse power and get rich off of the misery of others? There's so many unpunished crimes in society when people are left free to hurt others. Hell must exist if for no other reason to to balance the scales of justice in the universe. Number two, hell is the only place where sinners can go for eternity. People who have rejected Christ would not be happy in heaven. They would not be. People who have made, lived a life of murder and vindictiveness and crime could not be happy in an atmosphere that is always a place of praise and worship. Unforgiven sinners who have denied Christ would be miserable in heaven. Number three, the understanding of hell helps Christians who are on earth. It reminds us of the great salvation that we've received. And it reminds us of the great salvation that we want desperately to tell other people about with every breath and every opportunity that we have. It reminds us to marvel at the grace and the mercy of God. The awesome reality of hell ought to motivate us to tell all of our friends and loved ones about Jesus Christ and about the gospel because we don't want anyone to be lost, separated from God. And then the doctrine of hell demonstrates the greatness of God in ways that we f don't fully understand right now. The reality of hell will make manifest God's glory in the ages to come. Hell proves that God is both holy and just and that he keeps his word. I believe that one day Christians will praise the Lord that he judges sinners and that all his ways are right and true. And we should recognize that right now, that all of God's ways are right and true. And what we learn about hell from this story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16 is that, that we don't want to go there and we ought to do everything that we can to help other people make a conscientious decision that they don't want to go there either. I don't believe that God wants to send one person, no matter how wicked and evil and corrupt and bad they are, I don't believe that God wants to send one person to hell. But his justice causes him to fulfill his word because his word is always right and true. And while we don't know when Jesus is going to return, and we don't know, like 2 Peter 3 says, when the earth and all the works in it are going to be burned up. And we don't know when Gabriel's going to blow his trumpet and the end of time will be here. It seems to be the truth that the only reason, the only reason that God has not called time yet, the only reason that God has not told Gabriel, blow the trumpet, the only reason that God has not said this is it is because he wants to give everybody who possibly can another opportunity. That's the only thing that we can make sense out of the discussion about why hasn't he come. I don't know how you feel, but there's a big part of me that wants him to come right now. I wish he would come tonight because if we are children of God and we want to be with him, why would we not want him to come? Why would we not want him to call time right now so that, 
so that we can go and live with him throughout eternity and so we can go and see our loved ones who, who have left the earth. Heaven is our place. It's our home. That's where we want to be. But I'll confess to you there's another big part of me that says, please wait. Not yet. Because there are some people who are very dear to me who are not ready. And I want them to have another chance. And I want them to meet somebody else who can persuade them in ways better than I can. And I want them to have another opportunity to get things right. And so for that reason, I hope you'll wait a little bit longer. And because of our understanding of eternity, it becomes necessary for us to do everything that we can. And we've got to have the right spirit, and we've got to know people. Jude, verse 22 and 23, talks about there's some who have fallen away, and on some we've got to have compassion and deal with them with gentleness. And on others, we've got to snatch them as it were out of the fire, hating even the garment that has been stained by the flesh. How do you know, right? How, how do you know which ones you're supposed to, to be gentle with and which ones you're supposed to, to pull out of, jerk out of the fire? How do you know? Well, you've got to know them. We've got to know people. We've got to love people enough to know who they are and know about them so we can know the best way to deal with them. And, and we've got to pray that, that when we deal with them that we will do so with all of the love that's in our heart and we'll do so with the right spirit. I don't want to go to hell. And I don't want anybody I love to go there either. And so God has provided a way. And the way is Jesus. I appreciate Brian for leading these songs tonight about Jesus. Because he's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only way to keep from spending eternity separated from God. So I want to ask you tonight, are you ready? What if he does call time tonight? Are you ready? If you're not a Christian and you, you understand what we've talked about tonight in, to a degree, what are you waiting for? If you're not a Christian, if you've never been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, don't wait anymore. Come to Jesus tonight. He longs for you to come to him because he doesn't want to be separated from you for eternity. And if you're a Christian and there's sin in your life or there's something that's keeping you from, from having the joy and the knowledge of eternal life, make it right tonight. Don't put it off anymore. If we can help you, we invite you to come as we stand together and as we sing this song.